Hey everybody, welcome to my tutorial. This is Feng Zhu speaking and the next hour I'll be going over this uh, tutorial about how to design something that's familiar by taking common objects that we see in this world and combining them. I'm just going to go ahead and jump right into this tutorial and work my way backwards to explain all the various processes. So for right now, what we're looking at is some very cool planes and helicopters and tropical fish. So in this tutorial, I'm going to do is combine these two shapes together to form something new. And you see me circling some distinctive silhouettes off of fish right now. now these are some tropical fish. And this is actually a car that I, I bought in Maldives. Uh, it's a series of islands off the Indian coast. Uh, just there last week, and I saw this car that has this fish, and I thought, hey, this great you know shapes for design for this uh, tutorial and on the right here you see some planes this is the B58 Hustlers engine which is probably my all-time favorite uh, jet bomber and some various helicopters and what they share in common is these silhouettes very strong and distinctive silhouettes which is very important when it comes to design uh, especially when you're working in the entertainment industry such as games and films uh, your audience have a very small time to figure out what the heck you're looking at right so when two silhouettes are very similar that could confuse the audience and this is what this tutorial is all about is designing something that looks familiar yet strong enough uh, to survive the design phase right to make it a pass uh, to make it past the uh, your art directors and things like that so right now I'm drawing some uh, arrows here what there's what this is showing you is the strong shapes these fish have in common with each other you see the f very strong positive push to the negative same here with this guy right and he circles back with a negative and nature is very balanced and that's what makes these shapes work so well right nobody designed these well I guess nature designed them and they're very very good to balance and this is what you want to capture in a new design right we're going to be making something up from scratch but we want to keep this kind of balance so even if you look at these military planes right these these are not very are not designed by concept guys they're done by engineers but because of balance they naturally work themselves out to a shape that looks very very good so you know here's our reference that we use and let's just get started with the actual uh, drawing Okay, so now I can backtrack a little bit to explain what this tutorial is about and who is it for. Uh, the aim of this uh, demo here is actually for students. For students who have finished their fundamental studies, such as perspective, lighting, uh, color theory, and things like that. And now they're moving on to courses which are involves design. And from my experience teaching at various schools and even my school here, uh, one of the first things I see is that a lot of students tend to design quite randomly uh, because in their mind, it's not their fault, right? Because a lot of them don't come from design. They're just learning and when you're dealing with fundamental uh, skill training, uh, the design part is not exposed that much. So what they tend to do is design quite randomly because designing different designs, something new, sometimes their head is doing something that no one has seen. And no one has seen means I'm just going to draw random stuff on a piece of paper. But that's not the case. Uh, when it comes to mass market appeal to designs which sells, you actually have to design something that uh, looks nice, looks new, but somehow familiar enough that somebody who actually purchase or like your design, right? When something's too different, you're taking a much bigger chance, which is you know, good in the, uh, from a pure design sense. But from a business point of view, uh, most of your clients or even your own IPs, uh, they have to appeal to a big market. Uh, so let's go back to these drawings here. So I'm doing a series of designs uh, about this fighter, uh, these little spaceships I'm doing. And I'm going to do three categories. And I'm starting here with the fighter category. So, and what is a fighter? A fighter is very slick, very fast. Uh, they, they look aggressive, and that's what I'm doing here. And instead of the relying on the black silhouettes that you typically see, uh, which I think works well for characters and certain things like that, but for, for spaceships and things like that, I tend to like to draw them out. You even a thumbnail stage with uh, some details as you see here. So it helps me figure out where the wings are, where the guns are, and all that kind of stuff versus a complete cell of black silhouette. Um, but even by doing this line art, you still got to make sure that every single design looks different. And for me, the magic number is always three. Right? I'm going to do three roughs of this, I'm going to do three roughs of the next version, which is a heavy defender, and I'm going to do three roughs of the transport version. And not only are they different, these three drawings going to see here, different from each other, the three from each category is going to be very different. So your end result is you're going to have nine thumbnails in three different categories, right? Attack ships, defenders, and transports. And every single silhouette is different from each other and from as a whole. 
Okay, so here I am drawing the little fighter, very slick, and the key here is to combine what you saw in the fish and in the plane. Right, the fish is very slick, has this very slick positive upward angle, followed by a down reverse angle to finish the shape, and that's what these spaceships all have. You see the sloping forward angle, and then the tail section has these curves that makes the shape come back to itself. Uh, and for me here, I'm putting some figures for scale. It's always important as a designer, uh, because at the end of the day, your designs will never live as a drawing. They'll always go to the next stage, which is either a 3D drawing, I mean a 3D rendering, or a 3D model, for example. And so you got to make sure these things are clear, no matter what stage you're at uh, of your design phase. For example, an art director come in right now and look at these sketches and know exactly what you're doing. They go, oh, okay, I see spaceships and how big they are, and things like that, right? You don't have to hand wave these drawings, explain themselves. So here I'm starting the third phase. And let me explain a little bit about why I like the 1, 2, 3 rule when it comes to design. Because it's a good way to get a bunch of different designs out there to try without under-designing or over-designing. A, a typical good rule to follow is the first design you do is the safe one. This is something that you expect. For, spend. for example, you're working with a big client, most likely they'll want something quite safe because they are appealing to a very big market and they don't want to take chances with designs that nobody has seen because it is a risk. You could potentially a delivered design that nobody likes, right? And then the second design, you mix a little bit of cool, a little bit of yourself, and the generic thing together. And the third one is completely, maybe sometimes completely off the mark, right? Something that you want to do, you think what the spec should be, and maybe it's not what the client wants. However, it's just as cool. And by doing this way, your client's never going to be pissed because if you deliver something uh, on your third design that's not what they like, hey, they still got two other cool designs to choose from, right? But the cool thing is if they choose yours, that's even better. So that's what this design here, the third one I'm doing, is it's it's very aggressive, looks very uh, fish-like, right? like a predator fish, but it's quite round. And it's a little bit different than the top two, which are basically spaceships, right? So if I'm des delivering this to a client or doing this IP for myself, this will be the little bit more riskier design, but that still follows the design spec, where it, which is mixing fish, you know, tropical fish, and and uh, jet aircraft. So here I am, uh, making sure that the curves are following each other. Right. Oh, this video, by the way, you're watching this at uh, 2x the speed. Uh, so this entire video is about two hour, uh, no, one hour long. Sorry, uh, on time compressed, I should say, is two hours. So you're watching a little bit faster than I typically work. Uh, but I do draw relatively fast. It's just something you get used to uh, as you work in this industry for long enough. You, you tend to draw quite quickly. Um, but yeah, it's definitely sped up here. So here we go, some details and putting the cockpit and things like that, adding little micro details. And these are things that give us a scale. Right? So even though we're focusing on silhouette, these drawings in, in the design company could actually sometimes become the final design. right? Uh, just in case this project's under timeline or under rush, this actually is enough information for a very talented 3D modeler to go to the next stage. All you need to do is provide a rough front, I mean, a rough top view and things like that, and you could go with this design. Right? My philosophy is always, whatever you're doing, from the roughest drawing to the cleanest drawing, that at any stage you could stop production and the work you've done up to that point is useful. Uh, versus, you know, even some students I've worked with in the past is they're doing very scratchy drawings or things that are, you know, it's good for themselves, but they're two, two three hours in and you can't put any of that stuff into production. So for me, I, I, being a production person, that's very important to keep your work, you know, even, it doesn't matter if you're doing paintings or drawings, always make sure you could actually use it at any stage of the day. Right? And I ran into that situation many times working in-house at studios where you just, hey, I'm just going to do a rough drawing. And then your art director shows up and says, like, dude, man, we gotta, we got to put this in production now because the 3D guy's ready. Right? And then you just that's the drawing you send off. It's not even finished, but it's got enough information. And that's what I'm doing here with the these roughs here. Okay? Sorry for my uh, bad grammar here. I'm doing these uh, in real time, so it's a little, little hard here. Okay, so... That's these little ships. Take a last look, and we're gonna start the next round. So this one is going to be uh, what are we doing? Defenders. So what what's defender ships? Right, the first three series is fighters. They're very aggressive, and you tend to make them front aggressive, meaning that they're gonna chase after you. They're not gonna run away from anything. Right, they're gonna come get you. Defenders, on the other hand, has a little bit of fighter aggressiveness to it. However, they could also 
you know, take a take a hit in battle. They they could run away from you, or they could just act like shields, right? So they're a little heavier in their posture, making them maybe they're a little slower. They're not as fast, right? And a good good analogy is in you know, World War Two. You know, you got the P fifty one Mustangs, and that's definitely a fighter, right? They're made to kill. And then you got the, for example, P forty seven Thunderbolts, which is a fighter, but also a very heavy defender. Those guys could take a lot of rounds from enemy bullets and still fly. And so that's what I'm doing here with these spaceships. So the kind of fish I chose for this is a little bit you know the little fatter fish a little bit of you know still a hunter but they got a little bit of girth on them right to, to give that defensive feel and notice the front aggression I put into this into this design same thing but everything gets enlarged the engines much bigger for for the heavy speed they, they need to get right to push all that weight around and still some lighter fin areas to to make it slick okay because at the end of the day I don't want a piece of block I want this to be uh, very very streamlined like a fish or a jet okay so you can see a lot of uh, accelerated lines, these curves, uh, I guess the transportation world, they call it accelerated curves, which are these curves that start very fast and you can see speed inside these lines. Okay, uh, That's what the top of this ship is made out of, a bunch of those lines. Oh, by the way, you're going to see some random video glitches here and there, and that's uh, mostly resolved Painter. It's a great software, but uh, it does have some graphical glitches that's it's very annoying. So, uh, But they appear rarely, so don't don't let it bug you. Okay, so just adding more details and things like that. I remember drawing this section here, you know, when I was doing it, it looks fine, but as you zoom out, this actually looks like like a, some kind of face laughing. So later on, you actually see me erasing, erasing the front of this vehicle out, because it's quite funny. And here we go with the last finishing touches on this guy, and we'll move on to the uh, second vehicle here. Adding some last minute details here and there, and you see, you know, I, I like to work with uh, many drawings at once because that way it keeps the entire work paste uh, quite interesting because you know, you're never on a single piece of paper or in this case the digital paper and just focusing on one design by working with many things at the same time your mind's constantly adjusting to this design because in the, the day it doesn't mean that whatever you put down on paper is the last thing you're gonna do is you know it's not setting stone right so as you're working with other designs you can still see the previous ones on the page and you can always go back and fix them and you see me do that a lot here and even when I do my final drawings which you later or see in this video, uh, I do all the final designs on the same page, and you can always you know cut them out to become individual ones. But when I'm working, I have to work with everything at once. And I, I, a lot of designers I know work this way as well. It just keeps your mind flowing, so you don't get uh, narrowly focused on the single. Uh, design in front of you, right? You're looking at everything as a whole always, and you can also use this method to compare silhouettes to make sure uh, that you're not doing the same thing. And at the same time, you could borrow shapes that you do like from previous designs, right? Well, if sometimes you have a shape that's very cool, and you want to carry that over to your next design. So, a lot of advantages for working uh, everything at once. So here we are doing the uh, the second defender vehicle here, and uh, you can see me. Re-erasing the cockpit out, replace it with something else, and that's what design is all about. And let's let's back up again about the student designer. So the typical student that I faced oftentimes do design randomly, and they don't re use research material effectively. You know, the, why do designers use research all the time? It's not because we're copying designs or doing things like that. What we're looking for is interesting shapes and silhouettes, because at the end of the day, a designer is a problem solver who could come up with some very creative shapes by looking at the world around them and that's really what a designer does right because even the most uh, I guess unique design out there at the end of the day is still made out of shapes and stuff that we've seen before and that's what we're trying to do as designers to create something very new but to someone looking at the first time it doesn't feel so foreign that they don't go hey man what what am I looking at you know they, they see oh I see that's cool that's cool right and, th and that's the hardest word to teach to somebody you know make it cool I'm sure a lot of designers out there knows what I'm talking about you know you can't just tell a student hey that's not cool enough you know how do you art direct someone to make something cooler and a lot of that in my, in my opinion comes from 
the way a designer sees the world. And when they grew up, did they play a lot of toys? Did they watch a lot of movies? What was their imagination, basically their brain, exposed to a lot of shapes that the that you know people on Earth are used to, and designers in general are exposed to a lot more visuals than most people, right? For example, for myself, I, if I see a pen on my desk, I see spaceships on it. You know, I see the Wacom tablet, it looks like a landing platform. I look at the cup, it looks like a building, and that's how my mind works. And you're like, hey, I could put this cup on, on the te telephone and put my mouse next to it. Now it looks like some kind of crazy, um, you know, docking station. You know, and that's how my mind works. And I think a lot of designers' uh, brains work that way. Whereas a common person, you tell them to look at a mouse, they'll be like, that's a mouse. You look at a cup, that's a cup, right? There's like, do you see anything else in it? And no, I don't, right? And I think that's the d difference. And so for a student, what we try to teach is to open up their imagination. Because even the common person who's not a designer, you could teach a lot of this to them by seeing the proportions, the shapes that you find in these other objects are interesting. So in this tutorial with these ships and these fish, what we're trying to do is melting the two things together, and that's where the reference comes in play. You study the fish and you study the silhouette and how we did earlier in the in the beginning of this tutorial. Right? What shapes make these things cool? What makes the planes cool and what makes the fish cool, right? And you just carry all that stuff through. And with enough practice, you get a pretty good hang of combining random things together. And that's actually a very good way to go about design. Right, instead of randomly drawing on paper, like do you have no idea where you're going, you're wasting you know two hours drawing nothing basically. Just pick two very complete different subject matters and try your best as a designer to combine them. So in this case we have fighter jets and then we have tropical fish, right? In the real world these two things don't come in contact with each other unless a plane crashes into the ocean, right? They just don't don't relate. However, they are things I share. They're very streamlined. They both fly in a similar fashion, right? A plane flies, a fish swims, which is flying in the water. So they do have things that are in common. And that's good two things to combine. You know, some stuff off my top of my head, you could combine, for example, architecture and vehicles, right? You could put uh, Art Deco inside a police car. And they do that. And a lot of cars have that look. So when you're designing, that's a good way to go about it. If you're stuck or you want to just try something new, sometimes just pick two random stuff. You know, let's do butterfly combined with 1950s sports car, right? And try it. Because you can actually get some uh, pretty cool results. Um, I'm keeping this one relatively simple. And I chose fish and airplane for the fact that they're very familiar with most people. So if you're trying this at home as a student, uh, you know, to, to practice, it's, it's very easy to get the reference material as well. It's just go in Google or, you know, anything like ty typing jets and then typing tropical fish and there you are. You have everything you need to start designing. The, the rest of it is just practice. So um, that's how I go about a lot of my designs, especially when working with clients and things like that, that uh, especially the bigger ones. I typically want, you know, I want it to be different, but then they end the sentence with make sure, you know, I've seen it before, right? Um, again, it's not their fault. Big, big, bigger clients need these things to sell. And that's the core of this tutorial. Is when you first look at these designs, they don't go, "Oh, I see." You know, when you get the reactions like, "Oh, I see," you know, that's that's interesting, right? Typically, they probably don't like it. If they go, "Man, that's cool," hey, it maybe it's something that's not crazy different. But if someone says, "Hey, that's cool," most likely, it's a lot of people in the world is gonna say that's cool. And those are typical projects I. I tend to you know get my hands on you know especially on the video game side is you're appealing to a much bigger audience right a lot of designers um, you know not a lot I guess but you know even myself included we always want to do something much different than somebody else right we want to do something that's cr super creative no one has seen before but it's very hard to pull that off when you're working on, on projects that are monetary based because the audience member that are looking at this stuff are not designers they're common users right so especially look at a video game right you got the age between what 12 to 35 looking at this kind of stuff so you got to make sure it appeals to them because they might not know art deco they might not know these things right but they probably could feel it if you put it into designs so you deliver something that they they, they could relate to if you do something just so different that only a designer could appreciate uh, little challenging, definitely doable, challenging in the entertainment world. And also there's sometimes there's not enough time to explore those avenues, right? You could go to a client, go, dude, look at all these designs I've done. They're crazy, they're different, but they're like, dude, now my time, right? I want stuff that could sell. So this, so in the case you see here, whoop, there goes, there goes a graphical glitch, you saw that, right? So this ship, uh, a thir my third design is a little bit different. You see, I based this guy off of a fish slash, uh, what do you call those things? Uh, squids, I guess, you know, they have this 
pods are very different. That I like the aggressive nature of their heads. So you can see the the windshield on this guy, which is right there, right? That's the windshield. It's a navigator and a pilot, and I made that bulge on purpose instead of having a streamlined one curve cover both the pilot and the navigator. I made a bulge, and you see that on the on the Russian Hind helicopter. You see that on the RS seventy one trainer version. Right, the little bulge bubble, um, it just looks cool, right? And also it serves a function, right? Because if you streamline it too much, then the uh, the navigator or one of those guys is going to suffer because their head's going to hit the uh, windshield. By having a little bulge, they they have enough room to move their heads around. So, uh, but in a day in an entertainment business, it's all about cool, right? So it just looks cool in my opinion when I did that. Uh, so and that's something you borrow from nature, right? That aggressive nature. Because if I streamline that shape, maybe it'll work. But I think it looks a lot cooler with a little bit of a, a tiny bulge. And you see a little bit of balance act here, uh, detail versus strong shapes, right? And we'll look into that as we go into the third drawing here, which is the the transport drawings. What I'm talking about is you have a very strong silhouette. You have these big giant shapes, and to balance that out, you have areas of micro detail. You don't want to put micro detail everywhere. You don't want to go into copy and draw every knot and you know nut and bolt, and then go into engine drawing every single plate and heat vent and things like that. You want to balance these areas off. So if you have a big surface, you know, let's take a car for example, right? You have the hood; it's a big surface, but the details don't go there. The details go where the door handle is, where you know where the foot rest is, and all that kind of stuff, right? It makes the balance. So these spaceships same way; they have these huge giant surfaces. So where do I cram the details in this case? Well, the engine is a good place to put it because you got these huge surfaces, and it, then you have this ultra detail section. So you see me doing that quite a bit in these uh, in these designs. All right, so back to the transport. Transports, where are they, right? They, as soon as you mention transport to the general public, or at least someone who, who you know, watches video games and, and you know, movies and things like that, they tell you they're slow, they're big, and they're they're meant to carry things, you know, from point A to point B, and they're vulnerable to attack and all that kind of stuff. And that that's the appeal I'm gonna do here, right? This is not an attack transport. This is purely something that's gonna move, uh, cargo around. Uh, but still, gotta get that fish thing in there and some of the airplane stuff in there, right? So for these, I kind of look at the. I took a look at the uh, the reference we had in the beginning, which is a Tu-22 Blinder. It's a Soviet uh, bomber, and it's very different than the B-58 that we're looking at, right? The B-58 very streamlined, very slick. Whereas the Blinder, it, it's slick somewhat, but it's got all these parts on it that just looks like afterthoughts. It just stuck engines on them because they need the engines to work. And so I, I take that into account a little bit here with these, and you especially see the uh, in the third, in the second and third designs, where you, you tack some of these things on. Uh, because it doesn't matter, right? The transport is not in the battle. It doesn't matter. They just trying. To, if you, if you need more engine or need more wings to balance, just put it on. Whereas a fighter, you can't have those kind of things, right? It has to be designed from scratch to be slick. So these are all the kind of I guess social things that designer have to know. And, and for a student, it's very important to study these things, right? There's no point designing things if you don't even know how the current stuff in your world works. Right. Use reference, get a lot of books, and just study everything you can. So, uh, my favorite TV channel is History Channel, and Discovery Channel, right? And National Geographic, I guess. And all I do is just listen to them. I don't even watch most of the case. I just have it on in the background, just hear the narrator tell you about how things work. And a lot of that stuff goes into my work. Okay, so this guy is one of those. Looks like those angel fish, right? That's that no no hiding it there. I like those little angel fish. They're very flat. They're very. Um, you know, wide in the Y axis or Z axis. Okay, and it's got a huge engine to carry all that weight around. So again, this part doesn't make sense, right? For a spaceship to have huge engines, whatever, it doesn't matter, right? Because in space, there's no friction, and we all know that. You know, all designers know this kind of stuff, and you don't need aggressiveness or any kind of slickness in space, right? A cube and a sphere work the exact same way in space, uh, right? And a tiny engine, as there's force on it, will push the thing forward, just because there's no uh, reverse force, right? But in an entertainment context, try that in a video game, and man, no one's, everyone's gonna say your spaceship sucks, right? Because the common person expect spaceship to look like jets, and that's just something that's uh, been built into to pretty much your entire audience base, and that's why even spaceships today you see in films and games tend to look like jets, right? So uh, we do the same thing here because I could definitely do a NASA type airplane, right? Here I could do you know a just a sphere with some dude sitting in it and a bunch of engines hanging out and that's probably way more uh, functional than this guy in space but your client will be like what the heck are you doing you know we're not we're not doing a NASA realistic simulator here we're doing a space flight game you know with 
spaceship shooting at each other. We want these to be cool. You want the players to want to actually be inside these and fly them, right? And and buy them with virtual money or real money. And so that's where the appeal comes in. Okay, see here, I struggle a little bit with the cockpit, right? I'm drawing these, even though it's sped up, but when I was doing these, you know, there's no pausing, there's no any kind of delay or thinking ahead. I did these from scratch uh, without any pre-planning, just started them. So you're seeing exactly how I work in the real studio environment is I erase a lot. Right? I don't like this shape, I erase. Uh, back in the traditional days, we're working on paper. This was actually comes in the form of drawing out a lot of thumbnails. The thumbnail's purpose was to capture design until I liked it. So for one design, I might have up to 10, 20 thumbnails, right? Because you keep changing, keep changing. The digital, working digital, is basically the same thing. However, you're basically working with one thumbnail. You start with one, you just keep racing the same thumbnail until you get the design you like. Uh, but the process is the same. That's why you see a lot of erasing, a lot of undoing, and that, that saves a lot of time. Because in a traditional sense, you're basically drawing the same thumbnail over and over with uh, maybe a 10 to 20% change per thumbnail. right? I'm not talking about silhouette uh, here. I'm talking about finding the design, even for one design. It takes 20 or so uh, thumbnails, at least for myself. So here you can see I mess with these kind of shapes here. Right? I want to do a P50, uh, P47 uh, kind of front loaded uh, transport and you can see me kind of finding that shape within this so you see the erasing there and putting the cockpit in racing here and there it's just exactly like a thumbnail you see that F fixing that shape uh, now if this is on paper i have to restart it gotta draw it again gotta draw it again because uh, I, I don't use pencils that's something that the art center kind of uh, drilled into us which is you know you use a pencil you draw it twice you draw it twice you're wasting time right so we use a pen draw it once you're done um, which is, I guess, good practice in the old school days. And uh, we still make our students here do it as well, which is get used to drawing a pen. So, yeah. But by no means that's some kind of rule or law or anything like that. There's nothing in our industry just like that anyway. You know, as long as you could find work doing what you do best and any process you use, that's fine. Right? So, but what I'm teaching here is really meant for students who, at their stage, at student's stage, do need some kind of guidelines. Otherwise, uh, they tend to get lost. Okay. So this... Uh, the spaceship here, transport, looks like a big fat pigeon actually. But I just want to try something different, right? It's like a huge flying engine basically. It's like um, an engine off a 747 basically with some little cockpit on top and some wings. And adding a little bit of this space shuttle type of uh, thrusters on the back there. Now this is a little bit of cheat. These are these are side view drawings, right? But you, what you're seeing me doing there is a is a perspective wing sort of, right? But again, these are sort of for myself and half of production that even if you hand this off to a 3D modeler, just tell them, hey, that's not that wing that indicated is not in the middle. It's just the other side. Just did that to show a little bit of spatial uh, uh, difference. But in the sense of being a side view, that shouldn't be there, right? So these are, what I guess, we call artistic license in design. You know, you, you get away with certain little tiny things because it's not about perfection at the end of the day. It's about communicating your design, right? So everything we do from fundamental skills to lighting to all that, actually at the end of the day, all all of it is to get the stuff in your brain onto a surface that somebody else can understand. That's it, right? And some people do a drawing, some people do a sculpting, some people do a 3D. It actually doesn't really matter. So whatever works. Okay, so we keep drawing here, adding details. When you see me work, you probably don't see too much slowdown or hesitation. And this is the way I like to work. I like to keep stuff spontaneous. Uh, if I have to slow down, I'd rather start something new. Because in, in my mind, it's working so fast when I'm designing these that a lot of it becomes instinct, becomes a gut. And then the conscious side of you is pulling in those design references, right? So your hand and your brain is kind of just going 180 there, going, doing crazy shapes. And then the conscious side is like, okay, it has to make sure these shapes follow a plane. I mean, yeah, plane. And then part of it follows a fish. And then we get away from that, you raise the lines, go make sure it's a fish line, make sure it's a plane line, make sure it's a plane detail, make sure it's a fish detail. And that's what I'm constantly doing when I'm drawing these kind of things, right? My brain is just adjusting for these things. Um, later, when I'm moving to move into the perspective drawing, actually a lot of that goes away. What I'm doing here with this thumbnail is actually the hardest part, uh, at least in my opinion, for, for myself as a designer. Because here you're, you're basically creating something from nothing. You're staring at a piece of blank 
canvas and you have to come up with a new design that doesn't exist, right? That's the hardest part. Once you have the design, even a side view design, your job is pretty much done. Uh, for a student, that might be hard because you have to draw the drawing, you know, the design out in perspective, and that is a technical challenge. So for a student, the technical challenge part is hard. But when you work enough in this industry, the perspective part actually is not, not super difficult. It's still hard. You've got to concentrate. But it's not a stress factor. It just becomes a, uh, I guess, a mental exercise to make sure you can do it right, right? Um, this part is the, is the hard part. Your clients really is paying for your brain, right? They're not really paying for a nice drawing or things like that. They want a they want a design that they could go and make money off of, and that's where they're trading the the money they're paying you for. Okay, so this is the third design. So this is my little crazier design, which is again the third one, mixing uh, the two that I've done previously. And put it together, and I remember drawing this one and having a slight difficult time with it because it's like, man, it's hard, man. It looks like a kidney bean or something, you know, the whole time. But in my mind, I'm trying to see it in 3D. But sometimes design just doesn't work. But if it doesn't work, at least I struggle. I mean, not struggle. I doodle with it for a while to see if you could find it because you could undo and erase and do all that, right? So you could find it. And this one actually came out okay, uh, but definitely not my favorite of the of the three. So. Here I am drawing the wings, and here's the part where I'm talking about just putting stuff on, right? That the Soviet way, I guess, you know, which is like uh, we need some wings because it's not balanced. All right, stick some wings on it. Right? And it's a function over design type of uh, philosophy, and you get some pretty cool stuff out of that. You know, you can actually do an entire design project based off that, right? Which is like, what is what is the need? Then it make the function. Uh, you know, a lot of military stuff are results of that actually. So you can carry that philosophy to anything, right? Into a building. It's like we need air conditioning, so start with air conditioning. Now we need a roof. Now put the roof, and you end up with some pretty crazy stuff. So whereas here it's uh, it's about half, I guess more than half, about eighty percent styling using the reference of fish and plane, and maybe about twenty percent or so is is uh, educated guest functionality, right? These things don't work in real life but they're made to resemble that. And that's an important point uh, here, actually, is you got to have a little bit of real-world stuff in your designs, even if it's futuristic and high-tech and all that, because your audience, again, has to be familiar with it. right? You can always say these spaceships fly on some kind of new technology that does not have engines. It's cool, but very hard to pull off in the context of a game or a film. Because your audience watching it will be like, dude, I don't get it, man. How is that thing going forward? Right? Or a gamer is like, dude, that's so stupid, man. I don't get it. Uh, you, trust me, I'm t speaking from experience here. I've been on projects where you try things. He's like, hey, how about this engine? It works on you know, sound waves or something like that. Where it's not even an engine. It's just a series of little weird microphones in the back of the thing. And it pushes sound at a very low decibel or something like that, right? And it creates movement. Um, but from a visual standpoint, man, that's hard to sell off. And also from a sound, you know, perspective, it's hard to sound off. Because when a when this vehicle goes, goes forward, what do you do? You know, you create some distortion, I guess, in the back of it. But for the general audience, they just like, dude, I don't get it. It's not cool, and they're not going to use it. Uh, so, so that's why big engines, the uh, AKA I guess Star Wars, big glowy blue engines, is still being used today. Yeah, because people associate that with spaceships. Okay, so this is a third design. You can see trying to trying to make it work, right? And to some degree, it works, but still, to me, it looks like a kidney bean with a bunch of crazy stuff coming out of it. <laughs> All right, here's the scale. So these things are much bigger. All right, so that's three of each category. You know, we now have nine thumbnails, which I'll show you shortly. Of all of them together. Up to this point, I've been working in Painter, and this is Photoshop now, uh, with all the files imported in, basically. And just for myself, I'm gonna write the title of each one, so this is Fighter. So always good to have notes on your drawing, so just in case you send this off to somebody, they could get it. And here you got, oh, I think we call it Defenders here. And then what's going on here? Okay, this is uh, the transports. Sorry for the video glitching, that's uh, again, bad editing probably on my part. Photoshop a little bit there. 
uh, you can see I don't work with menus too much in Photoshop. I don't have you don't see any like go to file, open things like that. I, I hotkey everything. I memorized Photoshop probably ten years ago. I never used the menus, um, and I also use the uh, you press the F key right to cycle through screen modes. So that's the little video glitch that you see from time to time. It's me cycling to the full screen mode, uh, working the uh, the last stage, which is the complete black background and just the canvas, no menu. So, but when you cycle through, it creates these little video things. Okay, so what you can see here is a very, very rough drawing I did in Painter of the three shapes, uh, three designs I liked from the silhouettes. This is the fighter. Remember, this is the slick one that's very aggressive. That's the one I picked, and I do a very quick, rough pass to get into 3D form, but it's not an accurate drawing. And right now, what I'm about to do is take this into a into a nice perspective drawing, so it's clean, right? And I'm not gonna talk too much about the actual technique because this tutorial is not about that. This tutorial is about design. So what I'm going to talk about here is now how do you apply the details. This is where reference come into huge play. So even though you're seeing me doing here uh, a drawing on, a, on just a blank canvas, uh, to the side of this, you know, my screen is actually very high res and the video capture is capturing about half of it. The other half of the screen is actually displaying the reference image that I have from the beginning. Now you can see me actually pulling some images in. You see that? That's actually the, the thumbnail that they're earlier on the sitting on the side. And to the lower left, which is off the screen, is my reference. And that's why I'm looking at those helicopters, those airplanes, those engine parts. I'm constantly referencing those. You know, how big are they on a plane? What, what what's inside them? What kind of materials you know make those up? How does a how does a pilot even get into these kind of things, right? Uh, those little door handles and all that kind of stuff. And so this is the point where the design is done. And now you have to reference the correct level of detail. For example, this thing, right? This, this is a front end gun. It's a fighter. So just like the A-10 Thunderbolt uh, or Warhog, I guess, it has a front end gun. And it just tells you, I'm here to you know, kill you, right? So that's what a fighter does. So you reference that uh, design element into this new design. So. Right, these are all front aggressive lines. Those are the lines I try to use are all forward aggressive, meaning they accelerate away and towards the tail. So naturally, even though this uh, spacecraft is parked, it has a very front-oriented stance. It looks like it wants to go forward. And that's always good to capture inside anything you want to go fast, be a sp sports car or a fighter jet, or in this case, a fighter uh, spaceship. You want to capture that look. That's what we try to do here. So details here is all a little bit reference from the A10, but of course bent, right? It's round. It's not a straight uh, Gatling gun, but maybe it's a laser Gatling gun or something like that, right? That's a cool thing about working in entertainment industry. You know, a lot of this stuff just make it look like it works, and then we'll find a way to make it work, right? We're not doing engineering here, and that's something for students don't get caught up too much on, which is yes, we have to make sure this stuff looks real and could somewhat function, but don't let that take over your design because I, I do have students who tend to do more research than actually drawing right they'll actually go and pull you know, five pages of NASA spacecraft and new technology to be using and that stuff is great but when you're working on a project that stuff you gotta do on your own time that's something you can't charge your clients for surfing the web all day they'll be like dude you know you can't show up with a bunch of uh, Google images and charge them uh, two days worth of work right they'll freak out what they want they hired you to make sure you could design so that stuff you're doing constantly so even when you're not working on a project you're, you're doing research so when you do get on one you're just drawing you're sketching you're, you're doing the design part of it. Okay. So this view I'm doing is a typical product three-quarter view. This is a, a view that's used pretty much by all designers because it shows the most. It gets you a little bit of front view, gets a little bit of side, and a little bit of top. So for a 3D monitor, all you actually need is, you know, in the minimum case, just a single drawing. They will be able to produce this pr quite accurately in 3D. Now, if you want, you could do a back view of the same thing. Uh, and then that's all you need, really, right? So this view is most common since it shows the most. Uh, I'm back in Painter, by the way. I do do all my drawings in Painter still because I find its brush to be quite natural and it's very very fast program. And, and also, I know the new Adobe Photoshop has screen rotation, but I'm still using CS1 or something something crazy old. Um, I, I got the whole you know if it's not broken you know don't fix it kind of philosophy, especially on software. Because to me, new software always comes with bugs, and bugs slow me down and they they screw with your schedule. So I just keep using the same thing, right? <laughs>
Um, this painter I'm using is actually quite old too. I have no idea what version this is. Maybe eight, or nine, something like that. It's definitely not the newest one. Uh, that's why it's buggy. Doo -doo -doo. But it works. I only use one brush and painter, what you see here, and I don't do anything else with it. I just draw. I treat painter as my paper. And there it goes, the graphical glitch that I was talking about earlier. In the Photoshop, I use mostly for to to paint and manage layers and all that kind of stuff. Because uh, managing layers in Painter is uh, you don't want to do that; it's quite difficult. Okay, so on this design, I changed the detail a little bit uh, from from the original thumbnail. Again, when you're designing, nothing is set in stone. When you when I brought this guy into a 3D or well, 2D, 3D, I guess it just didn't feel right. I had these big um, fins on the back. It was starting to overtake the design in the sense that it became back heavy. As you see there, you see there, uh, you can pause it. Um, this is a fighter, so it has to be very front heavy, front aggressive, so it's always after you, right? By having that heavy tail, what it did is it, it slowed it down uh, in my mind. It, it, it added a lot of weight to the tail, so what I did here is I adjusted design to make the tail much lighter than the, uh, than the front and give it a typical, uh, what do you call these? Uh, it's not a T-tail, I forgot these are called, sorry. <laughs> okay, so finishing that. A little bit of tangency problem there, tangency meaning that two lines are coming together. So I added a little bit of line weight to pull this fin, this forward fin here, into the front. So it sits in front of the, the fuselage and it sits in front of the tail. That's a little gun that I added. So you got a big Gatling gun or Gatling laser in the front and you got the backup support gun uh, on the fuselage. I actually didn't weaponize these things too much. I didn't put missiles on them. I didn't put big things on them. Um, simply because, uh, as a general rule, when it comes to design, especially in my design school, and I believe our center as well, we tend to stay away from heavy military looking things from design because it's too easy. Right? You put a big old barrel and a bunch of missiles dangling off of anything, it's pretty much cool. And that doesn't solve design. Right? You know, seriously, you could just take a car and put a gun on top of it, it's cool. Um, so we tend to avoid that. So these vehicles here, yes, they're, in my mind, are military. Uh, they could definitely be civilianized, right? So you just take the gun out. You know, I don't draw the galley in the front. It could become a scouting vehicle or, or whatever you want. So here I'm, I'm referencing. I'm just pointing this in to show you that these are always on my screen in Photoshop, off to the left. So I'm kind of taking a look, just get my brain refreshed. Like, okay, I see, I see, I see. Okay, now back to the drawing, right? Get those details in. Reference my thumbnails. Oh yeah, I remember doing this, is the cockpit kept on giving me trouble. Something about it just didn't feel right, so I kept on uh, erasing things in and out. Um, this is something my friend, you know, Ryan actually told me before, just don't fall in love with the line drawing. When you're designing, you know, you're always changing the stuff around. So even though, yes, I spent some time drawing the cockpit and stuff, but again, if you don't like it, just take it out. Draw it again. Versus noodling, noodling something that is not going to get you anything, so... Even though I'm, I said that, I'm still noodling the cockpit, you see? see? I mess around with it all the time. It's like, I don't like it, I don't like it, I don't like it. But by having other designs, which is a good point to bring up here, you see all the um, the three I chose, they're on the same page. I could have broken these off to three separate canvases and worked each one individually. Um, but for me, I never worked like that. So sometimes I have a page with about you know nine or ten actually designs on one single ginormous canvas. This way I just go back and forth, back and forth. And some designs, I, it doesn't feel right. I just stop it at that point. I don't even go on with it. right? Because you got cooler designs on the page. And I've been working like that for a very long time, even back on the paper days, you know, just working on a bunch of designs at, at all at once. So I find it to be most effective and time uh, saves you a lot of time. So because you, you, just like you know, I guess a basketball player gets in that zone where you're shooting baskets all the time, you can actually get into a zone where you draw where every line is hitting the mark. Right? Every visual uh, thing you want to hit with your brain, your hand is coordinating perfectly with it. And that, I guess you call it get into a groove right, or something like that, right? And, and designers, I think, believe all get into that kind of zone. So by having a bunch of design, I mean, drawings on the same page, when in the zone for this drawing, I could move on to the next one. I could move on to the next one. Nothing breaks it because even a simple thing as closing this file or you know, minimalizing that and opening up another file could break your zone. And for me that that's quite annoying. So um, you know I work efficiently. And that's something we we quite try to teach students all the time, which is efficient work, because it's very different uh, working eight hours on something 
with some results versus someone who worked one hour but with great results, right? They're actually different because the amount of hours you put in doesn't necessarily mean you're working harder, right? Some employees of mine say, oh, dude, man, I'm putting 12 hours a day. So I go, dude, the guy who put in four hours do more work than you and more useful work you know, for my company. That's actually more beneficial to my company than someone who doesn't go home and work all day, right? It doesn't matter. So as designers, because a lot of us freelance and work on our, or work on our own projects, you have to manage this kind of stuff yourself. You know, you don't have a boss to tell you do you. You know, you're not working enough hours and things like that. So when you manage yourself, you have to be very efficient. You figure all these little things out. You know, or you ask your designer friends, you know, hey, dude, you know, how do you how do you get faster at this kind of stuff? And being fast doesn't mean you sacrifice your designs or anything like that. It's just efficiency. Just like here, we're working with three drawings at once. It's pure efficiency. I'm not doing this to to make my designs worse, or I really hope I'm not. Um, it's just purely to make things easier. Uh, same thing with and all this is done on a laptop by the way I'm not using I, I stopped using a desktop PC or I guess a boxed PC or whatever you call it a while ago because a laptop is so efficient you, know, you get all your work with you and you can actually take it on the road you know. even when I was on vacation take your laptop with you I'm not working but at least I could look at you know if I have references I could drop into my folders of references right away I don't need to go home and sync up a bunch of stuff and things like that all right here's the defender vehicle I chose the uh, the squid bulgy-ish looking vehicle. I kind of like that. As soon as I drew the uh, thumbnail, I, I liked it. Uh, so I'm going to use it here. Uh, I do change the proportions around slightly. Uh, even for this one, I made it more front heavy, even though it's a defender. I The tail on this one was also a little bit heavy in my silhouette in the, uh, the side view drawing. So I decrease that down a little bit. You can see me there trying out the shape. You see, trying to find that second bulge. So for students who watch what I'm talking about here is the the first cockpit most likely in the in the real world I'll be the pilot actually um, but in since the windshield is so small probably the, in this case the navigator sits in the front so he's got a little bit of a bulge so his helmet he got you look up and around without his helmet hitting the top imagine this is actually streamlined you either have to sunk the entire cock, uh, seating area down right or you can make the cockpit do this which is a little bulge gives him the, the pilots more room so back here is the the cockpit where the pilot in this case will sit so he's got a little bulge as well so he can look forward right because imagine him sitting up a little bit and looking over the navigator and without that bulge you can't do that his top of the helmet will hit the uh, hit the canopy okay so here I'm drawing the front by the way I talk about planes a lot because that's one of my favorite subjects um, I like planes I like to fly planes and all sorts of stuff anything related to flying related to flying I like so this is a down slope, uh, a borrow from the fish designs as well. Right, they have uh, one of the fish in the beginning had one of these very very front uh, slopes. And that's what I put in here. This shape here, I had to make sure I get it right. Right, this is almost like an egg shape sitting on top of this vehicle. So I gotta make sure that egg curves around back. You see the towards the top of this vehicle just right there. There's a negative a positive to a negative curve. And I gotta make sure that's really, really there. Because that's that's important to match the negative positive curve I have on those bulge. You see. So in design it's really about shape balance. It's about proportion balance. And back to that word, you know, is it cool? Oftentimes is it cool is just rebalancing of shapes. Right, if you put two wheels of a car too close together, it look like a cartoon. You put it too far apart, it look you know dorky or something like that. It's a fine balance of where to put these things. Right, like these little fins in the front, make it too big, make it too small. Who knows? Maybe it works, but you have this gut feeling of how big to make it, or how far away from each other are these shapes, and that that's that's design. See there, the tail, you can see it briefly there. So since this is a quick time or whatever you guys are watching this in, you can pause it to see those. So um, you can see the tail was quite heavy. Right, continue sketching away. The underdrawing is very, very loose. When I do those, there are perspective in sun. I try to keep it as good as I can. But I'm definitely not at that point focused on making sure the perspective is correct, but making making sure that the design looks good in uh, false 3D, I should say, right? For this design, I added two engines. This is uh, the the little booster engine you can see, and there's a bigger engine in the back. Uh, this goes along with the fact that it's a defender. It can fight in a fight, but if it needs to, it can ramp up its engines and go really, really fast and get the hell out of there, right? 
or if one gets shot down it keeps going which is usually the a lot of defender type of vehicles have these kind of rules right so the smaller engine on top here's the main engine which is giant intake right there so whatever I design I try to make a little stories in my head even for this and I try to create the world even though we're just doing three vehicles here uh, in my mind there's already a big uh, uh, I guess story taking place, right? What these guys are doing, maybe they're in space fighting, and then why why is their stuff look kind of like fish? Maybe they're kind of you know they come from a amphibious background, this race, right? Um, and all that kind of stuff. So that makes that that's makes designs fun. So even if you're designing a simple thing, maybe as a you know CD player in a film, try to imagine how people use that. You know why is it made that way? It just makes it more fun at the end of the day. Keep it interesting. Right, drawing this. I'm gonna take a sip of my coffee here. Ah, much better. Okay, doing the fin area. So I'm not I'm not covering the the viscom or or the visual com uh, communication part of this thing, which is the how to draw perspective drawings and stuff. I assume that people watching this um, already know this or if you don't then this one of the first things you gotta learn uh, fundamental skills is very very key in our industry because even though you could have a very active imagination and multi-million dollar ideas if you can't express those things out um, then it's very hard to make a living right? so especially what we do as visual designers nobody reads in our industry, you know what I'm saying, you can write all these notes like I have a cool idea about spaceships and it looks like fish and there, there's fighters and all that kind of stuff uh, good luck getting that into a art director's table, you know what I'm saying, they're like, go oh, show it to me, you know so so get your viscom down, that's, that's all schools that, you know, that I taught at uh, is the, one of their main focus because once you have that down, this stuff just takes time you get faster and faster and faster, but if you don't have your fundamentals down, I mean, no matter how hard you try, it's gonna be really, really difficult to get to that next stage, and you just get frustrated. You know, you have all these ideas, maybe you can see these crazy mega CDs in your head and these crazy cars driving around, but when you try to draw it out, it's like, dude, it doesn't look nothing like what in my head, right? And I'm sure a lot of you know what I'm talking about. But if you have your fundamental skills, even though in the beginning it might not look like it, it's gonna get closer and closer and closer because you know how to express those things out onto paper. And uh, the longer you work in this industry, the better you can connect your brain to what you actually draw on paper. So even for me t today, these days, you know, what I see in my head, I can't capture 100% of it. Right? But it's definitely a lot closer than when I was in Art Center. I remember back then, I used to take these classes in my head, I think of the coolest stuff. I'd be like, dude, I want this, I want that. Then you draw it out, it looks like a 50-year-old, you know, five-year-old drawing. I was like, dude, this thing sucks. You know, so that's nothing like in my head. And you get all frustrated. You're like, how come the other dude next to me is drawing so much cooler stuff? You know, man, it just takes time. But fundamental being the key. Um, know the rules. Uh, here we are, draw the little pilot guy. So even though uh, this is a, a quick design sketch, with about vehicles, I still put in the the human factor, which gives a scale. Because soon as someone looks at this, even someone not from my industry, just say some dude off the street saw this, they right away have a feel of this spaceship. They know that's big, it's heavy, right? It's it, it feels realistic by having a person inside, you know, next to it. And I don't spend too much time dueling on the pilot. If if this becomes a the next phase, for example, one of these. Uh, spaceship gets picked, or you pick it yourself if you're this your own project. Then you could go back and do a more even more detailed drawing than this, or even even a painting. And that's when you can work out the pilot, right? Because the pilot right now is very general. He's just a dude with a helmet, right? But maybe he has an outfit that that matches this vehicle. But for now, it's not my concern, so I don't waste time on it. All right, this is the last transport. I chose the one that looks like the angel fish because I thought that looked quite cool compared to the crazy wacky one, the the last third one I did. This drawing it was a little hard to get started with because, uh, again, I'm recording about only half the screen in Photoshop or a painter, and so it's quite difficult to draw. It's almost like you're drawing inside a box. Right? I can't see the top of the drawing when I'm at 100%. Because you see here, I can't see the bottom. Uh, whereas in full screen, I can. So when you draw perspective, uh, you need a little bit of visual cue of the surroundings. So in this case, I have to keep zooming out to see the uh, the surroundings, and then zoom back in to do the do the lines. So there's design. 
here it is in 3D and for all designers out there especially if you're working digital get that second screen you know, which I have as well you can throw all your references and all that kind of stuff on there so you don't need to do what I'm doing here we'll just keep pulling it in um, I shut off the second screen for this because uh, I don't want it to mess up the video recording but most of the time it's always the second screen up so by using perspective and things like that you can actually draw, draw the uh, other side of the cockpit which is very cool because you have a very good understanding of, of this object in 3D so even if a client came along and go hey chop this spaceship in half and show me all the interiors it doesn't stress a designer out someone with strong fundamental skills just well oh, that's cool that's fun right because you know exactly how it works in 3D so it just slices it right down the middle and show the inside the engines all that it's fun here is the ginormous engine or oh, exaggerated because for entertainment purposes that's what we do this engine real life would be like uh, five stories tall or something which is insanely stupid to make right but it's purely for uh, entertainment purpose it sells the object and for you students that are getting into your design classes it's definitely fun to try this stuff especially in the beginning because yes it is not the most I should say uh, genius way to go about design but it gets you results uh, very early on and fast and it looks cool and then as you get a hang of it you can start exploring your designs you can start mixing in the, maybe the sound engine I was talking about earlier with a little bit of a you know exhaust engine together and try to make something that's cool right but it can be beginning making stuff look the way people think it looks but you change it slightly so it's a little bit different is a very good way to go about design and it makes you very commercial so um, and the most of the work I get involved in are all related to this. You know, the bigger the clients you get, the more, I guess, safe the designs they want to be. I, I don't recall too many of my clients coming toward me and saying, do you make sure this is so different that no one has ever seen? I don't think I ever heard that once. It's always our target audience is, you know, we want to sell a million units of this, whatever thing we're doing. Therefore, you got to appeal to the boys. You got to appeal to the, to, you know, maybe... 10% of the girls and all that kind of stuff you know they give you these statistics and try to match it um, and even if they don't which is good in my case I like to explore and you give them some designs and they'll be like that's too different you know it's kind of like the sentence I heard once from a producer who said uh, you know yeah, design some guns that i never seen before I want to be super cool but make sure they look like from they, they look like the guns from aliens you know I literally got that from a producer once it's like okay you know <laughs> It's pretty funny. So here are all those little wing stuff that this guy has. Again, playing off the fact that it's heavy and they tack these on almost like a later uh, thing. It's kind of like the little fins you see on uh, passenger planes these days. You guys probably fly, see these little tiny fins at the end of the wing. Uh, those are not there from the beginning, right? They're, they're added on to to save fuel and give efficiency. So I, I chose uh, these kind of fins the same kind of way. That's why they're kind of tagged on. You later see the detail of, uh, when I put those in to express that that they they weren't molded as one piece. So the, all those things you learn, you know, I, I, no one taught me that in school. No one taught me all oh, fins on planes are efficient or things like that. You just learn by by ex exploring the world. And I really think that's the key of this entire tutorial. Yes, uh, yes, I'm showing you some drawings on how to do it, but it's about understanding the planet, understanding how these things work. Like this engine I'm doing, you know, a lot of my students ask me, how do you come up with these random shapes? It's it's not really random. It's like, dude, it kind of exists, man. Just take it from this. Maybe this is like a tractor engine or something, you know. Uh, you take it from that. You you melt it together with something else. And this way, you don't ever get stuck when you're drawing. You don't have to ponder, uh, staring at a blank screen, going, "What what do I do?" And you just go at it. Just boom, 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 knock it out. And this is also detail control here. So very flat, open surfaces with areas of very tight detail so here's the uh, the wing area that I told you earlier that's getting the treatment of being tagged on so minor details
So you can see I undo a lot, right? When two lines are tangent or something doesn't feel right, just do a quick undo and then the, you fixed it. Done. This supposed to be a headlight of some kind. I figure uh, flying in space is dark, right? You need some lights when they go into space stations and ports and stuff like that. Little stickers, you always see those on planes, right? Emergency things like for the rescue people. So these guys get stuck. Those little triangles point to where, um, how to pull the panel off and things like that. That's what they're for. So this guy's coming together, almost done. So I knew a little bit with my designs, but never to the fact to the point where I keep doing the same drawing over and over and over. Right? I'm always moving forward. I make sure that uh, watch the clock. It's like am I am I making pro you know, positive progress towards finishing this design? Because in the beginning of my career, man, I used to noodle stuff all the time, right? Erase it or, you know, white it out and draw another one, draw another one. You find yourself, you wasted hours and not getting anywhere, you know? So nowadays, it's like, even if you noodle mentally, like, stop. It's it's okay. Stop. Move on to the next part, right? And if you finish early, you can always go back and noodle it. Whereas the other way is, is dangerous because you can actually concentrate on one section, spend three hours on it, and then it's like four in the morning. And you're dead tired, and the, and the thing is due nine in the morning, right? And you're only halfway done. Then you're in trouble. So, some noodle stuff later. Even though I'm still noodling here, yeah, I know. Oh, I need another coffee. Some scratch lines. That big one's not my fault. That's painter. So these are little dots because it's just uh, such a giant transport. He probably bumps into little rocks or you know the pilot's drunk and flies himself into a space station get it scratched up and all that kind of stuff you know just make it more used you know George Lucas's used space world I guess these are more little headlights just to give a scale I just felt like it needs some details in the front and uh, you can see me going back and forth to other designs right that's the that's the uh, benefit of working uh, everything at the same time is you see mistakes. Your eye took about a you know twenty minute break from this drawing, and we get back to you like, hey, I, I noticed this mistake. I noticed, I noticed this mistake. But the hard part is you're always going to see mistakes in your drawings. You know, even this right now, I'm looking at it as I do. I should have done that better. I should have done this better. But you can't, right? In the in the production environment, you have so you just have so much time to finish something. Otherwise, you're going to screw yourself by working too many hours and getting the pretty much the same result. So. You have to teach yourself when to stop as well. So this guy's almost done. Just adding the last details, putting in the uh, whoa, another crazy painter craziness. What I'm doing right now is actually called noodling, which I said not to do. <laughs> Look at that, no results. You see, bad. Doo -doo -doo. Oh, save often. All right. I press Control S obsessively because uh, in the past, uh, Painter used to crash a lot on me, and when he crashed, it actually actually uh, corrupts the file, which is super annoying. So you can never get it back, right? And ever since then, I just save all the time, and I save it on a different file version. So you get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, whatever. So that way, just in case it does get corrupted, at least you have something to go back to versus a zero file. Okay, last take a look, and that's done. So now I'm gonna bring this sucker into Photoshop. So I uh, now we are in Photoshop, right? And I'm gonna just I'm not gonna render this to become a painting or anything like that because that's not what the tutorial is about. But to a point where it's presentable, we got three different designs of spaceships in three different classes, which is very good for your clients because they're like, dude, that's cool. I maybe it'll go with this direction. It gives them plenty to talk about. Plus you have all those side views which you can also send or show your art director, right? Um, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna make sure they're a little bit presentable than just a line drawing, but not spend too much time on it. Right? In the beginning phase of a project, especially I, I should say games, I should say, you have so much stuff to do that you typically, at least for myself, there's not enough time to, to bring everything to a photo real finish, uh, whereas in case in films you can. Um, but you still want to make it presentable. So I'm just going to go ahead and block these in so I can put a little bit of value over it. And a uh, little trick here, when you, when you try to block something in like what I'm doing here, 
do the positive and erase out the negative. What I mean is don't try to follow the line when you're actually first doing this, you know, with a small brush and trying to fill it in. Just take a big brush and glob over it, like blah, 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 glob over it. And then do what I'm doing right now, which is erase it out. It's a lot faster than to do the positive way. So this is the erase out method. It's just a little quick trick, a mere tip. By doing this, I basically have this drawing. Um, it's, a, it's a way to select it, basically, right? So now I have the... Uh, See I here I fast forward here to uh show you what I did. Trick put a quick drop shadow, I did a gradient, a little bit of light. This process I'm not showing you guys because it's this is Viscom stuff. Right? You can you can watch other tutorials for this type of work. I broke out the window on purpose, this way it's clear for you or the client to see the human factor. Because these things are actors themselves, right? Spaceships are actors when you put them in context in a space fight or whatever. So they need to have a front, they need to have a area where it's the face. Okay? And the cockpit in this case is it. So block this in. And this is almost done, pretty much, right? We we have uh, quite a bit of stuff here. And I'm adding a little bit of detail just to pull in some of the panels, make it a little bit more uh, 3D, I guess some highlights here and there and I'm, I won't waste your time on this, I'm actually going to work a little bit and fast forward to, to show the end result which only is about another 10-20 uh, minutes uh, of real time work that I fast forward so you guys don't see that part but it's quite quick and it's good enough, for this pass, we're, we're basically in design phase 1 which is the first uh, stab at the design so you also don't want to spend too much time because your clients might go dude this is completely the wrong direction dude you know you wait, don't waste like three days doing that right they just want to see some stuff right away um, so you don't want to be going back five days later with this just this right then you like they'll be pissed All right so here's the part where I um, drop in some color just to dis differentiate it out a little bit and then I put in more highlights, added some stuff here and there. Nothing fancy, very, very quick, just very simple, basic stuff. Added a pattern in there to make it more fish-like, aggressive. And that's it. And this is pretty much good enough to present. And uh, just make sure you title it, put some put some notes on it, and call it a day and you're done. right? And so because this is a video, you guys can pause. And it's always good to go back and see some of the important parts and see how these, especially in the beginning with the, working on the uh, side view profiles and study how these things are related to the fish and the chance and the planes and all that kind of stuff and see how these, where these details come from, where these shapes come from. And then practice it, right? Go get yourself some uh, fish reference, get yourself some airplane reference and just try to do this, try to combine it. You learn a lot by doing this. It builds up a lot of visual library in your head. Okay, and keep it loose. You, when you're practicing, you don't have to show this to anybody, right? So, so hopefully this tutorial helped you guys a lot uh, of how the work process I take when I'm designing. And this is what you're seeing is exactly what I do every day f uh, for my own projects. So last show, I'm just showing you guys the various designs. And, uh, and that's it for this tutorial. So hope, uh, have fun and uh, see you guys next time. And check back often. All right. I'm out. Oop, I'm still here. <laughs> I'm actually loading up the uh, silhouettes to show you guys uh, the other page. So you can actually send all this stuff off to your clients. Okay, this time I'm really out. So good luck to you out there and have fun. Talk to you guys soon.